Hi, welcome to Salt of the Earth. Today I'm chatting with Gemini Brett, a wonderful astrologer and storyteller. Welcome, Brett. Um, do you go by Gemini Brett? Yeah, our Brett's fine. Absolutely. And thank you for having me, Vrishka. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. So tell me about how you got to be a storyteller and what differentiates you and your style from other astrologers right now. Sure. Um, yeah, I find when I speak with other astrologers that there's kind of two major themes. One, it's like somebody was just called to the occult knowledge at a very young age and the astrology book fell off the shelf when they were seven and ever since then, you know, or it was in their lineage, their parents, you know, were speaking about the stars and planets. That was not the case for me. I fall into the other category, which was the, you know, very rigid kind of scientific mind. I have a mechanical engineering degree. You know, the idea that astrology is just one of these pseudosciences that is nonsense, that's something archaic that we should never look into. It's been disproven long ago. And it's interesting that scientists will have these tendencies of belief without ever performing science, you know. So it took me a long time just through many kind of synchronistic experiences in my life to release a lot of these layers of doubt and uh, belief systems so that I could open up to astrology. It happened very recently for me. It was um, November of 2010 when I had my first astrology reading. And um, the next month, I'm sorry, it was November of 2012. And the next month I went down to Peru I was going to do the whole end of the world thing at Machu Picchu. And, um, and I was there, but the world didn't seem to end, or maybe I didn't choose that stream. But the week before, I was in the jungles of Peru, and um, I had this conversation with Jupiter in the night sky that was, you know, maybe spiritual schizophrenia or maybe real, but it was like English language, four hours long, and Jupiter just kind of sat me down and reminded me that I'm an astrologer and reminded me what I've known um, and what I'm to learn and to speak about in this lifetime. And so it was at that point, you know, then it was just dealing with the fears of, oh, I'm going to leave a real job and, and do this astrology thing. Um, and, you know, the way that it lined up for me, it just, it all really fell in. And the more that I just really put my faith into it and and listen to that true voice of my passion and my fascination and my excitement and allow that to be the force that I follow in life. Um, everything else is just falling into place really gently and beautifully. So I think that's still kind of the, the main um, block that I deal with is kind of the traditions, the fear of what is real work in the world and do we have to have some nine to five job that then allows us to, you know, follow our passions or when we make our passion, our nine to five, or it typically becomes just a 24 hour thing, you know, does that actually bring to us the true sense of abundance? And I find that a very important calling in choosing our passion is to redefine abundance redefine success and i think that's where i am now and probably will be for a little while um i'm not one that just dives off the cliff and tests the wings really or jumps off the train trying to get onto the one moving in the right direction and i think there's some sense in allowing the train that you're on to slow down a little bit so that transition can be a little more safe <laughs> and that um what you learn in that process and the release of the old um, there's so much to that that instead of just cutting a cord, well, why are they there, you know, and what is this thing? And it can take us down into the traditions of our culture, of our lineage, perhaps even past lives, whatever it may be. But, you know, we all want this world where we are showered in abundance for following our passion and following our bliss in our heart. And it's up to us to create that world. So when we do that, when we answer that calling, then we can live as an example to ourselves, to spirit, and to others for them to choose that, and then that world manifests. 
Do you think your background in engineering made you even have an easier access to it once it started speaking to you or showing itself? Because that seems like a really short amount of time that this has become so fully alive in you. In some ways, yes, because the part of your question that I didn't answer, which is, is what makes me different than other astrologers, um, and I'm very much a sky astrologer. Um, so many astrologers spend most of their time looking down at the chart or the computer screen and even into the soul, which is all beautiful, but it's all this down and in. And we've kind of lost the up and out, that connection to the living sky. I like to say that we're all kind of collectively suffering from this illness called starvation. And uh, we've forgotten that connection. So, you know, when I visited Hawaii and saw you and you live under that very active, just beautiful living sky, it's a little bit easier to step outside and just engage with the wonder. And for those of us in the more urban environments, or I live in Seattle, and at this time of the year, the, the clouds can come in and just really disconnect us from the heavens in that sense. Um, that's something I think we're all dealing with collectively that we've forgotten. So why that makes me a little bit different is that so much of my practice is about a direct connection to the heavens, to the stars, to the planets. And what's really interesting for me personally is that when I look up and when I engage with that awe, somehow it grounds me and it connects me more to the earth. So I think there's some fear of, well, that's so big up there and that's this escape and that's this up and out when really the path is down and in. We could even see it as yang and yin. Um, but really it's about, to me, it's the marriage of heaven and earth. So why some of my scientific background participates is I've always had this fascination with the sky and have studied astronomy or even as a musician, I wanted to be a star, you know, and aeronautical engineering for a time and these kinds of things. And so when astrology, when I finally relaxed some of those biases that allowed astrology to come in, it was like, oh, right, this makes sense. This is what I've been learning my whole life. I just didn't know it. So I think, you know, when I teach astrology, I really try to, um, instead of teaching people what I know or what I think about it, um, I ask them to engage with their own intuitive astrolog astrologer, you know, so teaching people to remind themselves what they already know, I think is part of this thing, because these traditions are age old and from so many different cultures, Hawaii, where you live, there's such a rich star tradition. And there's something about traveling to different places and seeing how the sky shifts that is part of the, the beautiful wonder of the thing. I mean, the, the fact that I kind of awakened into my role as an astrologer in Peru, where the stars are so different than they are here. I mean, the whole zodiac, you know, all those constellations are upside down mm -hmm. there. Um, but that's been, that's been a very important part of my path. So when I teach astrology, I'm also teaching what we would call astronomy, or what used to be called astronomy. Um, because I feel it's not only about the charts and the archetypes, but it's so much about connecting to the living information that's always beaming down from us from that from the great big screen. You know? Well, you also have such a gift for stories and and history, I guess, and mythology. Have you ha already had that? experience inside of you or have you done all of this research and readings since your interest? Um, I guess inside of me, yes, but not consciously. Um, it was a couple months after I became an astrologer early in 2013 when I was looking into these different archetypes and I found this story about Gemini that really helped bring the Gemini archetype and its essence forward to me. And I realized that, wow, so many of these great mysteries and secrets have actually been encoded in the stories of old. And since they are old, and, and I'm not just talking about the Greco-Roman tradition, though, like most of my study has leaned there. I'm also interested in the Hawaiian mythos and the Native American and the Nordic traditions and South American. Um, but 
that somehow those stories live in the library of our cellular makeup. So we can access that. And I find so often, you know, in this, in this um, sharing that I call storytelling, that if I sit with somebody and I'm going to give them a reading, I could say, oh, well, your Mercury in the eighth is squaring Jupiter and all of this. And we can get into this lingo and this jargon that's just so airy and doesn't connect. But if I relate to somebody an old story that I see actually living mythically, archetypally in their own song, which is what I call the chart, the, the celestial fingerprint, and just tell the story and say, well, what does that bring up for you? Then we can really see how they relate. So part of it, I think, is um, honoring the traditions of verbal transmission that, in a sense, came before uh, the written word and came before the technical language that would keep the information from being heard the way that we're trying to share it. So how does astrology determine your own well-being in your life? Like when you wake up and in the winter might be dealing with some heaviness or depression or grief, do you check in? How, how does it drive or inform your life or assist you? Well, I love that you're channeling my own wintry depression and grief right now because that's very present and very real. I grew um, up in Germany. I know the pain. <laughs> yeah, in, in the myth, of, I mean, the more I get connected to the sky, the more difficult it can be to live in a place with so many clouds. Um, and I travel a lot for that matter, and I'm fortunate that I'm able to. But yeah, I mean, astrology is a, is a great assist. I mean, one thing we can just see kind of on the timeline of the soul, and we've each, I feel, in my own personal philosophy, kind of conducted the, the symphony of the planets to sing to us in different ways at different times in our lives. So one of the great gifts of astrology is, well, one of them is to look back at times of our lives where we have some regret some grief or whatever here was something i did that was so stupid and then you can see oh there was this alignment and wow actually i did that totally right you know i mean it's not necessarily how i would choose to have done it if i knew that energy was opening for me i might have set my intentions to steer that energy in such a different way that i could have engaged with it in a more um, blissful experience and something that I did have to regret for some time but looking back it's like oh that makes sense I mean so often in our lives it's like worst thing that ever happened to me oh wait the best thing that ever happened for me right and so the other side of that is looking ahead looking now well here's the energies that are presenting themselves now for the world now for me individually how can I like very devotionally set my intentions and, and practice into that intention so I can welcome that energy in such a way that I can engage with it consciously, knowingly, understanding that it is great mystery that, you know, I cannot necessarily determine exactly how it's going to come through, but if I align myself intentionally to that energetic, then I open myself to it, you know, I, I kind of summon evolution rather than just surrendering to it when it happens, you know, to me in some Darwinistic worldview. Mm -hmm. So when we speak about, you know, the winter and the depression, the grief and this kind of thing, well, we're at that time, right? You and I are speaking today is what, December 9th. And um, I was in Hawaii for two weeks and then came to, I actually went to the desert in the Southwest for a few days and then returned to Seattle. And, and then I escaped for a couple of weeks again and I'm back, but it's just been gray and raining and windy and, uh, and that's so real. And there's this question, and I think this time of the year is very much about this. It's, well, why are there seasons? Why does stuff die? Right? Why is there darkness? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? And those contemplations are such imperative avenues for us to travel down if we really want to experience the totality of the earth game you know what i mean and so that's such a beautiful essence of of the seasons themselves 
And then it can be a gift to live in this place. I often say that in Seattle, well, you know, part of the training is we have to find our own sunshine. We have to find our own light. You know, when it's not available to you from above, that has to come from below. That has to come from within. And then we can find our way to, to beam, but it can be very challenging. So for those of us um, who maybe fear some of the alignments as we read about them or hear about it on the periphery or Saturn in our chart or Mercury in retrograde, when we identify or project fear onto it and um, like the bad guys are coming, what, what do you suggest? Like you shared some things about Mercury that were really, really um, compelling. And it, it really changed my view on it. So I'd love to hear how you suggest for people to maybe find find the bright side of these planets. Sure. Well, and I love that you bring in Mercury because today is Wednesday. Miracle Ace, it's his day. Um, and Mercury's at today, a very, very significant place of the sky, which is he's aligned to the galactic center or what the Mayans called Hunab Ku, you know, great grandmother who creates us. And at this time, in this epoch that we've incarnated into, the galactic center aligns to our winter solstice, which is not always the case. And this is the story of galactic alignment. And that's like a whole nother thread. But to get back into kind of the fear projection or astrology as a fear mechanism, which is so prevalent, right? I mean, even with the archetypes and... And even in a sense like, oh, I'm a Scorpio and he's a Leo and she's a Taurus or whatever, there's a lot of like divide and conquer alive in that. You know, there's a lot of you are your sun sign. There are these 12 tribes and you belong to only one of them. And then we read like newspaper astrology, which really, from my experience, tends to present the shadow aspect of the archetype. And you read these things and it's like, well, why would I want to be that? And why would I want to be that? And why? Well, I am this one, so let's find the beauty in this thing and it's the good one or whatever. But yeah, I mean, there's so many um, astrologers out there that I've come across that are really like, oh, this is, you know, all this is going to collapse because this alignment zero or Mercury retrograde, as you brought up, you know, what a great statement. Like, don't travel. You know, the banks are going to screw up, your communication's dead, the computers will explode, all of technology, like three weeks, three times a year where it's just like a living nightmare. And, you know, I love the way that you asked the question because, well, what is it when we project these fears? And we don't have to contemplate that through the astrological lens. I mean, what happens in our lifetime when we are projecting fears in any regard well, we are manifesting them and creating that and you know it's not necessarily some bad thing because one of the great experiences of the earth game is to look at our fears and to look at our darkness you know but if we're not conscious that we're doing that then there's really no point to it so i think in astrology that's one of the reasons why um a lot of us really won't look at astrology because it can be so negative or on the other end, it can be so like, just like light and airy and, you know, general that sometimes beautiful things are said, but it doesn't really seem to have any resonance in reality. So with Mercury retrograde, and it's a great example. Um, first of all, what Mercury retrograde means is astronomically, like what is happening at that time is Mercury is passing Earth in our mutual orbits around the sun. And um, so that brings Mercury closest to Earth she can ever be, or she can ever be. I shouldn't really genderize the great Hermes. I think there's a reason why it's Hermes. Um, but so if we think of maybe like the sun's energy being like great mystery or being source or in the microcosm of spirit that our solar system is, like. That's creation in a way, right? That's the light. So is Mercury kind of coming between the sun and earth, disrupting that in some ways? I like to think of them like in like a wave pool and the sun's putting out these ripples and what happens when like 
the rubber duck comes in the way of the ripple and it gets divided before it can hit us. So maybe there is some idea that when Mercury is between the sun and the earth, it's disrupting the field of the sun. I'm not sure. But the idea that um, everything traditionally mercurial, which is commerce and travel and communication and these wonderful things, um, goes backwards, I have a hard time resonating with that. In fact, this time right now, <clears throat> Mercury's on the other side of his cycle. Um, so he's direct and everyone's like, it's okay, Mercury's not retrograde. And yet, Mercury cannot be seen, he's on the other side of the sun right now. He's as far from Earth as he can be. Why is this not a time that we fear? Why is this not a time when these things um, associated with the planet Mercury are less available to us because he's so far away and literally blocked by this huge orb of light that is the sun. And nobody really speaks about that. So part of the fear and the superstition around retrograde planets, I think comes to us from the old days when it was purely a, a geocentric or earth centered worldview because there was no way to describe why the heck the planet for most of the time will move one direction through the zodiac and then suddenly just stop and turn around. And there were all of these mathematical models devised to try to explain this and none of them worked, right? And when we can't explain a thing, especially for the scientific, or even maybe we could say like that, that masculine mind, then this fear comes in. We, don't, we fear a thing we can't understand. So when we had this revelation of a heliocentric or sun-centered worldview, well, it was much easier to understand. It's just like passing a car on the highway. It appears to move backwards for a time, right? Because the planets pass each other. So astronomy, in a sense, I feel has released that superstition of a retrograde planet. And astrology hasn't necessarily caught up to that. And I think part of that is because astrology and astronomy for some strange reason were divorced some time ago and one of my great intentions is to be you know member to the glue that brings them back together so with mercury retrograde and here he is he's like right here well why don't we say that's a time where actually the things mercurial are um expanded and amplified and you know when Santa comes to town, people put the cookies by the fireplace, or why don't we put some cookies out for Mercury, right? <laughs> Instead, what do we say? Like, oh no, Mercury. Did, did, you, did all that just happen? Did you hear like static and stuff or was that only on my end? It, it froze. I just think it's unbelievable that we're speaking about Mercury and the screen totally froze, but it's probably from my end. Well, right, and that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like yeah. in one world view, and I think this is becoming very prevalent that we create our experience, that we are literally awakening into the real dream, which we've called real life, and the synchronicities and the symbols, or we're speaking of a topic and then it presents itself, aren't we creating that, right? And so what happens when everyone who's tuned into astrology, and granted that's a pretty low percentage of people in the world, but if for three weeks it's like, oh no, Mercury retrograde, all this terrible stuff's gonna happen, well, aren't we then manifesting a reality or a dream where we experience everything that we would project. So what if instead we said, here's Mercury, he's close by, put the cookies out, like we're gonna communicate like never before, travel will be amazing, all these different things, what if we create that worldview? Well, right now with Mercury being in the galactic center, how, how's that affecting us? And, and share some more, did you mention that Mercury was also a trickster. I'm not sure. I'd love to hear more of the character outside of the retrograde phenomena. Yeah, well, 
I didn't mention that, but Mercury did, and I'm glad you heard it because he does have that energy. I mean, if you think about right now, like Mercury is invisible, he's in the darkness. It's really interesting that when a planet gets this close to the sun, it goes blind, or at least we are blind to its light. And with Mercury's proximity to the sun, he's consistently diving back and forth into um, our conscious awareness and then into the darkness. He's a morning star for a short amount of time, and then he's down into the, into the underworld, is what shamanic astrology, that's the paradigm, that's the stock of my starry stew. We call that the underworld because, well, we imagine this is how the ancients would have imagined it. You know, here's this bright light of Venus, and then she disappears in the world stage for two months. Where did she go? Right? And with Mercury, it's, she's just consistently, he's a morning star, and then he's gone. And then he's an evening star, and then he's gone. And, um, and Mercury, as a trickster, well, one of the reasons there is he's very difficult to see because he's always performing these beautiful, magical, disappearing acts. I've talked to astrologers who have been around for a long time who have said, oh, I've only seen Mercury once in my life. And... Really, that just goes back to this point that astrologers aren't watching the sky because I've seen Mercury like seven times this year alone. But he is a trickster in that way, and he's always so close to the sun that he's either just before sunrise or just after sunset. And therefore, he's down in kind of that lower part of the horizon where we've created some pollution and whatever, and he's twinkling like a star instead of a steady light, like a planet often. And so I've been out with astrologers who have been practicing for many years and like, well, look at Mercury. He's like really high and bright. It's like, that's not Mercury. That can't be Mercury. It's too high. It's, you know, it's like, no, that's Mercury. But so part of the trickster energy is just that. Are, is that a planet? Is that a star? Like, I don't even know. I've got to break out my maps and stuff. Um, and another energy is, is one of the great gifts and services of Mercury as a god, if you will, was psychopomp. I mean, he was the one who would take the souls of the dead to their new home below, right? And he was the only one who could travel the many realms and bring people safely to other dimensions, we could say, or to Olympus or to Hades and bring them back. And there's a little bit of the trickster involved there. And just the hermetic traditions, right? So Hermes, you know, I mean, there was basically a whole religion around Hermes um, that goes probably back to Egypt. Hermes Trismegistus in Greece was really related to who they called Thoth, which in, in Egypt, or really the land that was called Kemet, they called Dahuti, right? Who's the ibis-headed scribe, the inventor of language and of music and mathematics, um, also seen as a baboon. And Hermes Trismegistus, or Mercurius was his name um, from the Latin fold, he was this trickster god, right? He wasn't all light. He had a very shadowy and dark side. And I think, you know, for me, in this idea of like polytheism, or will some do this and some do that, um, or each of these different essences, netters, they were called in Kemet, principles of ourselves. They all have light. They all have shadow. So some, I think what we're dealing with collective, in the collective consciousness, in the heart field, is these religions that have basically said, oh, it's all about the light, only seek the light, and the other side is Satan in the darkness, and push that away. Well, for Mercury, for Hermes, and probably for all of the planets, um, they each have essences of light and shadow. And how much more beautiful and complete is that? Because we all do. And so does the earth. And that gets back to this time of the changing of the seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were speaking about seasons earlier, and um, you've mentioned, touched upon uh, these guides that kind of can travel between, you know, the afterlife or the underworld. And that made me think of Persephone. Uh, years ago, I had this palm reader. I mean, he really literally, he didn't know anything about me and, and um, has this whole science about reading the palms, different than the average 
street palm reader, but um, he pretty much said, oh, well, you're the Persephone archetype. You know, you go to the underworld, you're in the darkest of the dark, and you tend to draw people to you like strangers telling you their deepest, darkest grief or secret, and and you offer a spark of light back. And um, brought a lot of that uh, mythology to my attention, and you touched upon that with the wintry seasons. What is that reflected right now in uh, in the stars? Well, sure. I mean, certainly just in the seasons alone. I mean, I would love, and we'll do this offline sometime, but I'd love to see where your Mercury is because he might be in this position close to the sun like he is now where we would say, well, he's it's the psychopomp because... He's in the darkness. And so that tends to give us that gift of, oh, I can be the crow. Like I can help bring you into your shadow to see the shiny things to bring back. You know what I mean? And that's really a wonderful service and a wonderful gift. And I've seen people with that alignment. It's like, well, what do you do? Well, I, I play harp for people as they're transitioning, you know, as they're dying. It's like, wow, what a great service. But yeah, that's, um, that's one of these things, Mercurial, that I think people will shy away from. In the Persephone story, he's the one that went down into Hades and brought her back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, most listeners, I, I assume, will be familiar with the Persephone story, but I'll tell a very quick version of that, if that's okay, so we can travel into that more archetypally. Um, for me, Persephone was the ultimate kind of Theresian flower child of the springs. She lived during a golden age. Right, and she was the love of her mother's life. Her mother was Demeter, or in the Roman, the Latin, Demeter's series, and Persephone is Proserpina. Um, but Demeter, her mother had chosen the path of the virgin. And it's like, wait a second, how, so she had this virgin birth. Well, virgin did not mean and does not mean what we were taught it is that it's chaste and celibate. It's simply a woman who stands strong onto her own. So the virgin goddesses of the myths, many of them were quite sensuous and some even rather promiscuous, which was not the case for Ceres, but she was not celibate and she had children. She had two children before Persephone that were talking horses of whom I know very little, but Persephone was her daughter by her brother Zeus. And Persephone was very much the love of Demeter's life. So when I feel into the story, they're kind of skipping gaily through the fields of flowers because they lived at a golden age when it was always summer. And Persephone begins to grow up. And these other mysteries of spring become really imperative for her exploration, sensuality, intimacy as an art form, pollination. And I feel that her mom didn't want her to grow up. And so was doing everything she could to keep her young. So the story tells us that one day Persephone is out picking flowers with her friends and gathering these flowers into her basket and there's roses and irises and whatever. And then her eye is caught by this strange flower in the distance, this, this new flower and it's dark, it's black and silver. And there's something about it that she just cannot deny her attraction to it. So she silently leaves the flower picking party and heads over there and leans down to gather this flower for her basket. And just then she feels this strong surge of no, and it's fear. But she doesn't know what fear is because she's lived her whole life in this golden age under the protection of her loving mother, and she doesn't listen. Maybe she does listen, and she picks it. And as she does, this great chasm in the earth opens, and out comes the golden chariot pulled by four black fire-breathing stallions and carrying the very chiseled and strong Uncle Hades, or Pluto, who we're told snatches the girl, abducts her, and takes her into that chasm in the earth, which closes above them and takes her down to his underworld kingdom of Hades and makes her unwillingly his bride. So the stories then tell us that Persephone kind of went on a, on a, a hunger strike, 
because it's known that if you eat of the fruits of the underworld, you will remain there forever. And I'm not sure about that, but what I am sure of is the part of the story that tells us her mother freaks out. You know, she feels this in her bones, what has happened to my daughter. She runs to the field and accosts these girls. Where is Persephone? I, I don't know. She was just here. You're worthless, you know, and then she heads out to all the temples of the gods and the goddesses, asking them, imploring, where is my daughter gone? And she doesn't know. And it's really interesting in the story. I don't think I'll relay all that now, how she does find out. Well, she becomes midwife to this prince. She's in disguise. And it's very much like the Osiris Isis story, actually. And in, the, in both stories, she's, she falls for this prince. She almost kind of adopts this prince to take the place of her missing daughter. And she decides to give the great gift to the prince, which is to make him immortal. So every night she's holding the prince, who's this little baby, over an open flame, burning the mortality off of him. And like the last moment of this process, his mother, the queen, comes in and is like, what the hell are you doing? My baby, get him up, you know. And so she takes him off the fire and she reveals her true form and says, well, you just lost the opportunity for your son to be immortal. And then what ends up happening is one of the prince's brothers now sees her real form and says, well, I've heard this rumor that your daughter was taken into the underworld and Hecate, right, the goddess of, of darkness, some would say, confirms this. So now Ceres, Demeter, she knows better than to go mess with her brother Hades on his turf. And she instead goes up and seeks counsel with Zeus. And she says, our brother Hades has taken my daughter to the underworld and I demand her rightful return to my side. Zeus says, our daughter has been made a queen. What's a more rightful place for a princess? Little girls grow up and become women. Princesses grow up and become queens. This is the right place for Persephone. So I won't bring her back. Now, if you'd like to make another little play thing for yourself, that can be arranged, right? So she like spits in his face and comes back to earth and shaking her fist to the heavens. Do they not know the power of woman? Have they forgotten like the great energy of Demeter, who is the goddess of the crops? Let's see how Zeus feels about his precious human starving when I strike the crops from the land. And this is one of these rare times when we actually held the favor of Zeus. So this can't be allowed, but Zeus has no power over the crops. That's Demeter's territory. So he has to concede. And Mercury is sent to Hades to bring Persephone home. And he tells her, he warns the girl, it's like, hey, don't take any gifts on your way out. But she does. Hades gives her a pomegranate. And some traditions would say that she ate three or six of its seeds. And Mercury brings her home to her mom. It's this joyous reunion. Oh, sweetie, I've missed you so. It must have been terrible there. Tell me. No, don't tell me. I never want to hear about it. And nothing like that will ever happen again. Your mother will never leave your side. But the joy in Demeter's heart is rapidly drained when she asks and Persephone tells that she ate of these pomegranate seeds. And she says, you fool of a girl, don't you know now half of the year, every year you will have to spend in the underworld. And so when I'm like a fly on a flower in this story and I'm looking in, I actually see Persephone turn away and coyly smile because there's this power in the underworld. There's this magic. There's this evolutionary opportunity when we allow ourselves to look into our, our own shadow down in this place where she is a queen and when you see these great paintings of Persephone and Pluto sitting side by side in the Hades thrones there's like all this party happening and like weird armadillos on fire and stuff it looks kind of cool but you know for me she chose to eat that pomegranate she chose to pick the flower and was she really kidnapped by this deceitful Uncle Hades, or did she simply jump into the golden ride with the hot guy? You know, because there was this suppression to her womanhood. There was this challenge that wouldn't allow her to grow up. And so every year we're told Persephone descends into the underworld. And at that time, the crops are struck. This is 
fall, right? The leaves fall from the trees. We head into the winter and in the spring she returns. And this is the great gift of seasons that allow us to look not only at our light, but also at our shadow. And in the end, together, Persephone and her mother Demeter gave right to the rise to the Eleusian mysteries, the mysteries of death and rebirth. So this was also part of the initiation for Demeter to come into her great wisdom and this gift that she's left for all of us. So I've always seen that not as it's been told as some victimization of the feminine or some torture of the earth, but as the beautiful gift of that feminine energy who is not afraid to dive into the mysteries of death because it is the mysteries of rebirth in this great gift that she's given to us in the earth. And one more thing I'll say about that, once I was telling the story just in that fashion, um, I later found my way to older stories. Persephone in Greece was also called Kore, which is a name that existed from previous times in the African traditions. And their stories weren't written, right? But when you hear them, I mean, the way that I hear them, it's almost like this alien invasion story. And Corey chose to go into the underworld because she knew that when she did, it would bring a winter that would either make this earth um, unattractive or even not habitable by the invading force. So she did this to save the earth. And I like personally to see the strength of the feminine story, not the weakness, and to see the um, initiative gift of the masculine in the story not just the abduction. Mm -hmm. there, there's a whole mixture in there of, of her character. I mean, I hear like surrender, sacrifice, ser service, empowerment, leadership, creation. I mean, it, it, it's all of it. I love the way that you demonstrate a story because it's like you can't really judge or take sides. You know, it's all, it, it's the symphony, the way that you share the story. I, I love it. They're amazing. So you asked earlier about, you know, Saturn and Mercury retrograde. Well, Pluto is like this great enemy, right? It's like, oh, he's not even a planet anymore. <laughs> Push him away, right? Or it's this darkness and then Pluto trans in your time. Things are going to be really dark or, you know, but what is the great service of Pluto in the story? Well, he initiated the girl into womanhood, which was her calling, which was her quest. He initiated the mother into releasing that child that she wanted to keep as her baby for her lifetime. And he helped in this great service of initiating the seasons on the earth, which are so imperative. And to get back to like the depression, the grief that can sometimes come to us at this time of the year when the seasons are changing, right? Or this is like just after sunset, if we take the, the annual um, transition of the sun to its height um, a, a, into a kind of daily metaphor, well, that time is challenging, right? The sun has set, the light is gone. If we take ourselves back to some, you know, contemplations of consciousness before shelter and electricity and whatever, well, here comes the night and we better keep that fire warm because the predators are coming around and whatever. And I really love to enter these 12 archetypes um, through like a, a seasonal perspective. This, this has to be a Northern Hemisphere worldview when we do this, which doesn't mean it doesn't work in the Southern Hemisphere, but Libra, the scales, I mean, this is equal day and night, you know, autumn equinox and equal light and shadow, but we're heading into the darkness, you know? And Scorpio comes around, what do we hear? You know, saw when Halloween, the veil is thin. Well, there's so much death in the air, right? I mean, the leaves are falling, falling and you know, the crops are dying. You better have a good last harvest, you know? And it's about death and the mysteries of death and rebirth. And so Sagittarius comes around, we're just in the last days there and you have this month to like, think about it. Why does stuff die? Why are there seasons? Why is there shadow? Why is there depression? Why is there grief, right? When Capricorn comes around, you don't really have time to think about it anymore. Now it's just like, hey, you better have like canned the green beans and 
ration the food because we got to go into the cave and into the darkness and make it through the winter. And we could do that all the way around the 12 archetypes if you'd like. But I, I find this time right now to be this great time, this great time of the vision quest, this great time of the philosopher asking these questions that we are encouraged not to, asking the questions that cannot be answered with anything but a greater question. And, you know, the other side of it is, oh, well, what about like, how has it been done in the past? How do we make it through the winter? And, you know, unrolling the scroll and what prayer must I speak, you know? And so there can be a really strong like religiosity in that archetype as well. That's the other side of it. I think that's important for us not to look away from, especially what's, with what's being shown to us in the world right now. So on that note, I'd love to hear um, what the solstice is bringing us. Like, what can we expect? And I'd love to hear what are your questions right now? Um, sure. The solstice in general is the birth of the sun. And that's really interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Why do we start our days at midnight? We start our days in the darkest hour. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As many of the old traditions, they would begin their day at sunrise, which seems to make sense. Or begin the calendar year at the spring equinox, which is the other side of Libra, right? We're equal light and shadow, but now we're coming into the light. We're coming into the glory. Like it's the resurrection. We made it, you know, and that's like Easter time. So why is the birth of the sun in the midst of the darkness? Well, because right now we're going into the time of the longest night, right? The earliest sunset. And solstice means the stopping of the sun, right? So the sun at equinox rises due east and sets due west, no matter where you are. And then it's rising for us in the northern hemisphere further and further south every day and setting further and further south. So a lower arc in the sky and shorter days and longer nights. Well, solstice, it stops in that path and kind of hangs out summer's, uh, winter solstice and then starts coming back to the north, coming back to the light, right? And so that, in a way, is the death and the birth. So solstice always in these mysteries, you know, of our current culture of, Christmas and these kinds of things where we've projected all this stuff onto Santa Claus and lost like the shamanic truth in those stories. And, and now there's like Joe the elf and you know, all the, the reindeer stuff, whatever. And putting these lights on the tree. Well, what is the tree? Because that's the old statement, you know, that the coniferous tree, the pine that, that lives throughout all seasons and stays green, you know, and we could go deep into the holly and the ivy and the bells and all that stuff. But so solstice for me, it's always like, am I willing to go into the rich darkness of myself and to see the light there, to reignite the candle and to know that we're coming back up. And so I love that image of Capricorn as goat because, well, the mountain goat really climbs that mountain that steep climb and here it is like the sun is about to make its path back to its glory back to its brightness um as far as like what am i contemplating personally at this time well there's so much i mean there's so many places we could go in that regard but i will say that there's one very significant there's many but there's one very significant astrological alignment that i'm i'm contemplating frequently right now, which is called Saturn square Neptune. And um, what that means astronomically is that from an earth centered point of view, where Saturn is now, um, which is in the sign of Sagittarius, it's 90 degrees or square to where Neptune is now, which is in the sign of Pisces. And the square, it's like a first quarter moon, this one. Right, so with these astrological aspects, 
astronomical alignments that can sound so technical and weird. We can really lose you know, the essence of the thing and exploring it through the jargon. Well, bringing it back to an experiential level, um, for me, that's working with the phases of the moon. Because here's something that we can see every month. We can set our intentions to it. We can watch them unfold. And the new moon, right, the beginning of the cycle for most is when the moon and the sun come together. And that's happening with all these other, like, longer planetary cycles. So the Saturn-Neptune cycle is about 35 years long, right, where a new moon cycle is 29 days. Much longer thing. And they came together, they had their new moon, like in 1989. And now this is like the first quarter phase through that cycle. The square, the first quarter moon, it's said to bring this week, at least in the moon game that I personally play, it brings this time of tension. That square energy, I hear a lot of the planetary alignments as like sounds, and it's like these notes are coming from these directions to meet here or being pushed in this this weird way it's like it's not in agreement it's not totally opposed to bring some kind of balance it's like this this just kind of strange two forces coming in different directions and saturn and neptune are such different energies that them being in square brings up so much for me and so much wonder about how this will manifest in my own life and in the world at large because Saturn is like the tangible, the real world, the stuff we can touch, you know? And in some ways, like the rules and the laws of being. And Neptune is like the celestial and the dream. I mean, to bring a little more essence to that, Saturn forever has been the edge. It was, it's the last visible planet and therefore the slowest moving planet that we can see. It was always known to be the edge of the solar system until, at least in modern times, 1781. This guy, William Herschel, with a telescope, points this thing, thinks he sees a comet, and then they track it for a few days. It's like, oh my gosh, that's a planet. This was Uranus. This is the time of Industrial Revolution, American Revolution, French Revolution, and technology, you see. So William Herschel also at least in modern times, maybe rediscovered infrared by using a prism to uh, split visible light, right? So in these two examples, using a telescope to find a planet that's not visible, uh, using a prism to find light that's not visible, well, we're expanding our experience beyond the limitations of our senses. And so Uranus has a lot of those qualities, breakthrough, revolution, eccentricity, mad science, technology. Now, Neptune was discovered in 1846, and it, we found it with a telescope, but we knew where to point the telescopes because it was mathematically calculated. There was um, gravitational, gravitational perturbations on Uranus's orbit that were noticed, and something must be pulling on it and it must be about this big, and it must be there. And so they point the telescopes, it took them a while, and there's Neptune, right? So see, even in that, it's telling us what? We are all connected. We all have pull on one another. And so Neptune has that essence of oneness, you know, this dream of out of the many one, this reconnection to source, and this celestial kind of, dreamy, even like foggy and confusing energy where Saturn is very real and practical. So in this alignment, and there'll be three exact alignments. The first was Thanksgiving Day 2015, and there's two in 2016. There's a little bit of like the dream and reality squaring off with one another. So I would love to ask you, have you experienced some of that energy in your own life of late? <laughs> For years. For many years. It just keeps getting more ridiculous, you know, and more literal. I mean, I, I, I can't explain that I think, you know, 48 hours before I met you, uh, I was painting and I, you know, I'm new to painting, but I just opened a National Geographic and I just let it 
inspire me and come to me. And it was like, boom, Jimmy Carter, boom, Hawaiian petroglyphs, boom, the pyramids, boom, an elephant, you know, like remover of obstacles, the divine masculine, here are these Hawaiian stories that are ancient, the pyramids that are complete mystery and power, and who knows what's, how that, what that has to do with what's going on in the world right now. I don't know any of this. These are just themes that are layering and coming through. And I meet you and you touched on all of it, you know? Mm. How can I say to you, oh my God, do you want to see my painting? You know, I mean, I don't even know what to do with all of the synchronicities. And um, yeah, I mean, I have too many to share. And it, it can make you feel crazy because it, at this point, who am I going to call and tell about it? You know, I just have to go, oh, okay, or this amazing thing happened, and I look up, and there's a full rainbow. And then we fly here, and I get out of the plane, and there's a full rainbow. You know, I have my symbols, and I know how to find them or see them, so it's kind of like life is always winking at me, but I'm the only one who can put meaning on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we want to know, what does it mean? Does this mean I have to make a certain choice, or is it just like, Hey, you're on the right track. I don't know. I try yeah, to make decisions wrong. based on them, and it doesn't mean that that was the right decision. It could have just been, yeah, there's a black cat walking on the street. <laughs> That's all. A leaf is falling. That's all. <laughs> I love what you just said. I was like, how can I say this to you? Let me show you my painting. Right? These are things that can't be expressed in words. And there's definitely a, a, a beauty in attempting to do that. There is information exchanged, but so much more. And let me show you this painting, right? And that's to me where the agreement of these two energies, well, let me take that celestial information that's coming in that imagery and then, and then create it on this canvas, create it on something real so I can actually show you what I'm experiencing. And that's these two energies in agreement. So when we see like some of the, the tense, alignments well it's conflict to bring to us resolution so when there's a little bit of dream versus reality are we willing to see our truths you know are we willing to come out of delusion you know come out of like a world of like false flags and even 1984 kind of i don't want to get too deep into the conspiracy world but there are themes alive right now that take us back to 9-11 and Right here is a great, just dark, crazy event that's endless if you choose to look into it courageously and find some truth in there. Um, and it's so dreamy and delusional and weird, but a lot of us in our own experience or in the external experience, which is really just a projection of us anyway, right? A lot of us really fear to look into the challenging, the dark places, this kind of thing. This is the challenge right now. Are you willing to see truth on a whole new level? Are you willing to awaken from the dream of like your non-reality and awaken into the dream of your reality to become a conscious creator in that dream, to hold the, the paintbrush in your hand? Because even on the highest level, when we're allowing creator to create through us, the canvas does not paint itself. That's what we're here for. And if we are willing to courageously claim our own truth and follow our own passions and not hide from the challenging and the shadowy experiences, then the great gift that we're seeing here is right now I can bring that creation into manifest reality. I can paint a new image of truth, yeah. Um, I just think about these two signs, Sagittarius and, and Pisces, where Saturn and Sag and Neptune and Pisces are now. I should do yoga hands because the video will get me backwards, but anyway, um, they frame winter. Yeah, so winter solstice is the first degree of Capricorn in the, in the Western astrological traditions. And then Aquarius. So to move on just a little bit further, I'm talking about, well, Capricorn, now we're in the cave and we hear these things about governance and police with Capricorn. Well, 
if you've got a few hundred people in the cave and you've got to ration the food and you've got to hold it down if somebody's misbehaving or whatever, sure, that stuff comes in. But the true essence of Capricorn, it's an earth sign, it's a yin sign, it's a feminine sign, it's the trunk of the tree, it's the roots. So there is a structure, but it's organic structure. And, and the great archetype that one of my teachers, Daniel Jamario, brings forth is the Council of Grandmothers. You know, the natural wisdom. That wisdom when we're not afraid to root ourselves into the dark and pristine waters of the earth and drink from the wisdom of our cellular makeup, you know, then if we live in accordance with just divine and true wisdom, there's not going to be fights and people breaking the law, whatever. Anyway, Aquarius comes to us and, well, you've been in the cave for a long time. It's even colder, right? This is like seasonal lag. And now maybe you're not really excited to spend time with these crew of people that you've been with for the last month. So you go off and you sit on your own for some time and meditate, whatever. And the consciousness expands and you connect to the mind of the heavens and you see some new breakthrough and then you bring that back to community. Here's a new way we can do things like the mad scientist, the revolutionary. And now you're up against tradition, which is Capricorn. You're up against like the scriptures, which can be Sagittarius on the other side, right? But these breakthroughs, we can do it different next year. We can do it different right now. That really lives in the Aquarius phase. And then we come to Pisces and the sun's coming back. And it's like, da 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 da, you know, and thank God. And we made it. And then Aries and the resurrection. So when I look at this statement of Pisces, of Neptune and Sagittarius, just as the two, there's a thing, but that they're in Sagittarius and um, Pisces. I think I said Neptune and Sagittarius instead of Neptune and Saturn before. Um, it's interesting because those two signs frame the winter. Traditionally, Pisces and Sagittarius were associated with Jupiter. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. What is it that Jupiter's two traditional signs embrace the winter? On the way in, it's like, I got your back. You can do this. Don't worry. Like, go in there. You'll make it out. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you did it, you know? Mm -hmm. And But there's also this kind of, like, religion and faith in there. And in between Capricorn and Aquarius, the two signs traditionally ruled by Saturn. So Saturn, who has this really bad rap, this winter, he's cold, he's dark. Mythologically, he castrated his father. He ate his children. And now the children eating thing, that's one thing, but he castrated his father for his mother, you know? So there's a beauty in that. And in the old times, like Saturn ruled over this golden age. And there's something, again, about coming to Earth, which without the light of the sun is a dark ball in space, you know? That we have this opportunity in their Earth game to evolve and that doesn't come only through facing the light, the sun, but allowing it to warm our back because when we turn away from it, we see our shadow and only then, you know? And can we look to that and can we work with that and embrace that to find the light within it, which isn't like taping the angel wings on the demon and in the great words of the saint Tom Waits, if I exercise my devils, my angels will leave too. It's just embracing all of us, you know, and knowing that as the alchemist, my shadow is my light. It is me. Why would I push away these things I've been told are negative? Instead, can I embrace them? And if I do, then I'm all of who I came to be, and, and I can embrace all of the world. So things that I'm seeing in my own experience, one is this idea of like, you know, terrorism and how much of that is reality and how much of that is just being told to me as some program of more divide and conquer and religiosity and weirdness. And I would say there's some of both in there. On one side, like, ancient, ancient temples and writings and tablets just being destroyed. You know, our living history, our access into the ancient wisdom being eradicated. 
and people will see that happening in the Middle East and really like judge that well here at home what about the things that the Smithsonian has suppressed for a long time and if you're not onto that trip like just do a search for ancient civilizations and giants on the internet and have a fun few months um, but then also for me personally there's this thing that's happening right now which is like flat earth theory and I don't know if that's invaded your your web stream yet or not I, I'm curious about that. It, it, I've thought about it since you've been, uh, when you brought up Saturn, and I'm wondering why I'm hearing about this. Well, can you share more about this theory coming up? Well, we're hearing so much about it. I mean, the theory, basically, from what most people are saying, is like, hey, the world is not round as you've been told it is. It's not circling the sun. It's flat as the ancients always knew it was. There's a dome ceiling, maybe even seven domes over us. Uh, the map looks like the UN flag with the North Pole in the middle, the continents surrounding them, South America, or South, the South Pole, Antarctica is actually this ring that encompasses this whole disk that we're on in space. And I mean, it's a strange thing. It just feels so wrong to me. And I think actually there's a lot of scientific reasons that I've looked into where it breaks down. But what I love in it is it's this, wonderful challenge for me because do I per like I teach that the earth is round and I teach about the solstices and I teach astronomy and astrology from a heliocentric worldview so part of it's like oh my gosh okay I have to interrupt you but what about all of the photographs we have from space from astronauts from their own well, phones I mean the claim is that that is like NASA and the control system just creating these imageries to limit you to a false worldview so you'll forget that you're actually the center of the world which is trying to take you away from the truth of like religion and, and spirit or religion like killing spirit and so here's the trip like I don't believe in the flat earth I do believe our earth is a sphere I don't believe that NASA, though there is some very shadowy aspects to NASA, and that's a whole other trip, I don't believe like all these images from space were doctored to like limit us in this worldview and keep us from awakening. And I, in fact, think like the whole thing, which is this amazing stream online right now, is a little bit of a distraction that would keep our revolutionary energy um, divided or confused to go into something that's not necessarily going to serve evolution. And yet, it's a really wonderful challenge that I see in my own personal experience as an essence of the Saturn-Neptune square of, can I look into it? Can I release my belief systems? Because my belief system is I live on this spinning globe that's orbiting the sun and, and you know, do I know that? Have I really experienced that personally? Can I feel the earth spin? Have I been to space? No. It's all what I learned. It's all, in a sense, my religion. You know what I mean? Science is the cult that I was raised within. And I find more and more in my own experience that so much what I was taught from that worldview is actually false. Now, I don't think the earth as a sphere is false. And I think when you look to the sky, when you honor retrograde planets and the phases of the moon and all these things, like it just kind of gets ridiculous and it feels backwards. But I'm amazed and fascinated by two things. One, the challenge for me personally to watch these millions of videos that are online right now and the anger that I have. And because it, it's testing my belief systems. It's like somebody told me my God is fake. You know what I mean? And I'm going to go on crusade and like <laughs> abolish that, whatever. And that energy is a really interesting perspective. So for me personally, this is one of the challenges that presents. I think we're all, all meant to be presented with a challenge to look into the depths of our belief systems that would limit us, some belief that would limit us from seeking. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, because I am so astrological, astronomical this is a great theme for me to dive into and then when I feel that that reaction that pain that fear that warlike response well where does that come from what is that and that allows me to go where into my darkness into the unknown 
to find some light, to find some understanding. But on another level, on like a global level, I really do feel like it's this distraction because if you search like flat earth on YouTube right now, you will find thousands of videos and really well thought out and beautifully crafted videos um, about this and how is it so prevalent, right? So is it real? Is it some like literally organized disinformation campaign, you know, and I wonder about that because just planetarily, well, Saturn and Sagittarius, can we bring reality to higher truths? Can we bring structure to the nature of seeking the great beyond to really activate the vision quest, the philosophy to ask the big questions, right? And as I said earlier, there's resonance with 9-11 and why that is, is because Saturn has a 29 year trip around the, the Zodiac, okay? So that's why we have Saturn return at 29, 30 years old, a term that most people have heard. Well, 9-11 was 15 years ago, next year, 2016. And so what that means is it's halfway to its Saturn return. And what that means is it's now in the time of its life that we all have when we're 14, 15 years old, that is Saturn opposition. Okay. And here's Saturn kind of looking back at where it was at that time. And at that time, Saturn was in Gemini on the other side of the Zodiac and Pluto was in Sagittarius. So now we're getting kind of technical, but let me just finish this thought form and I'll try to bring it back to reality. Pluto moves very slowly. So Pluto through the signs is bringing us the opportunity for absolute shamanic destructuring and restructuring of a thing. The death and rebirth of, uh, of an archetypal energy. For example, now Pluto since 2008 and all the way till 2024 is in the sign of Capricorn. We're looking at the death and rebirth of governance, of structure, of bringing back the wisdom of indigenous traditions that were all but destroyed but that have survived to come teach us again and we're seeing this all over the place a beautiful example on the island where you live is the indigenous like um resistance to a new telescope on mauna kea and the astronomers are like well what the hell's happening like this never this never went down before we put all sorts of telescopes and it's like well pluto and capricorn dude but you can't say that to those people, right? So when Pluto was moving through Sagittarius, higher truth, wisdom, seeking, right? I like to call Sagittarius the smoke that rises from the fire. It travels far and wide. It's seeking the heavens. And well, when Pluto moved through there, before it did, I'm listening to all these astrologers speak about that time. Here it comes. We're going to have the opportunity for real truth to come in for this real awakening. But what happened in that time, like if you look at 2099 and like the whole Y2K thing, and then especially 9-11, well, it seems that there was this event orchestrated by people, by spirits, by who knows what, maybe all of the above, that gave us this incredible catalyst for awakening to truth for those of us who are courageous enough to dive into that darkness or this opportunity to just shut down and to trap us into the delusions of a false world that is handed to us, right? And so now I see this flat earth thing, that's like Saturn in this essence. It's like, oh, well, let me just give you a structure that's totally nonsense and tell you to give all of your energy to that. And to get out in the streets with like your soapbox and your sign that's you live on a flat earth and all this stuff that's like, well, can't we use that energy for our own unfoldment into a higher truth? Are we really doing ourselves and others a service by saying, well, we live in a false reality, so I'm going to show that is true by exploring an even more false reality. It's, it's really it's really incredible and weird, right? And that's what this thing, overall, the Saturn-Neptune thing, it's meant to be weird and it's meant to be challenging. And that's one of the great ways why I'm experiencing it personally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it brings up so much. And uh, I mean, it sounds like smoke and mirrors, distraction, and where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And when our own personal faiths are tested, it is like redefining your own faith and still blindly trusting your faith, that part that you've always trusted that you might not be able to describe. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm feeling and hearing about this period. And I love that you keep pointing this out and also that symbol behind your head, like around the time I met you, this symbol has just been coming to me, coming to me. It's always about the plus and the X. And to me, it's the intersection, the intersection of all these influences that we're having in, in daily in so many different ways. And we're having to navigate, is this distraction? Is this truth? Is this my value? What choice do I make in this? So it's like life is an intersection. So in a way, it's, it's almost exciting in the form that you're describing it because I feel like it is a time for our minds to be blown. And the universe is so infinitely creative in blowing our minds that we can't even make up in the ways it's going to challenge us or knock us on off our feet or tap us on the back with this big surprise. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, I love the wisdom that you're sharing there so much because it is exciting. It is beautiful. It is evolutionary. It is a spark of wonder. Do you know? So we can feel so small in these things. We can feel like there's nothing we can do. Like the whole world is shifting and, and you know, but no, like we're being stimulated. We're being activated. And if we dive into that with fascination and with wonder and with passion, then that energetic current, which can seem so dark and like such a cell is actually the freedom from it. You know what I mean? And so it's really what we make of the world. And we can say, well, that's like back to that Mercury retrograde theme. Like, do I want to see that as some negative thing and create that experience for myself? Or do I want to see it as some beautiful opportunity and, and give to Mercury and ask him to give back? And that's my practice in that cycle, which is a conversation for another time. And, and in the sake of time, because I know we're nearing the end here, I would love to talk to you about this sometime too. Um, this is um, from the Shipibo tradition and it's something that I picked up in Peru during that time where I became an astrologer of that conversation with Jupiter. But what's happening here is there's this cross as you saw, and there's also another X in the middle. And um, when I speak about how Mercury's at galactic center now, and when you ask me, well, what are my contemplations around the solstice? Well, we live at this amazing time that only happens once every 24,000 years, maybe 26,000 years. That's the kind of the currently accepted model where the, the birth of the sun, the winter solstice sun, is aligned to the galactic center with the Mayans called Great Grandmother who created us and feeds us with her light, right? So it's like a 80, 100 year window, and it's probably what the whole 2012 trip is about. There's Celtic information, Hawaiian information I found when I was out there, Native American wisdom, biblical wisdom, like all sorts of things pointing to the glory and the beauty and the wonder of this time where we have all incarnated to experience this galactic alignment. Because there's an earth cross which is the seasons and the directions. And this is, you know, tropical Western astrology in its essence. And then there's sky crosses where the Milky Way, the plane of our galaxy crosses the ecliptic, the path of the sun or the plane of our solar system. There's two of those, one right at galactic center, where the only two constellations of the zodiac that have arrows, the archer's arrow, Sagittarius and the tail of the scorpion point at the center of the galaxy. So if that doesn't tell you that the ancients who created the system knew more than we give them credit for, I don't know what will. And then on the other side, looking exactly away from the center of the galaxy, on the hand of the high man, on the club of Orion, between the twins and the bowl, there's another place, another cross in the sky. 
And only once every 24, 25, 26,000 years do these crosses align. And we are at that time now, and Mercury's there right now, and the sun's coming close because that's happening in our age at winter solstice. And there's resonance with the dawning of the age of Aquarius and so much fun, just esoteric like wonders that we can tickle um, another time if you'd like. But that's kind of where my mind's at. So I'm dealing with this kind of not immediate but more present um, Saturn Neptune focus. My my huge passion and my service right now is to Venus cycles that we haven't talked about. I have a whole YouTube um, presentation of this called, that's called the Thirteenth Flower, and it's the um, the global ascent, like the global goddess and her archetypal awakening, and how the masculine supports that. And so that's a whole another fascination and conversation. But all of this happening in this greater framework of galactic alignment that is such a rare thing and to be living on earth at this time is such a wonder and such a gift and with all these challenges and you know the passion that we've shared today and even getting into some of these challenging topics um, for me it's like well there is a bright and beautiful light in that shadowy thing so if we allow ourselves to dive into the tidal wave instead of running away from it, then we might just find the peace and the beauty on the other side. And that's this great challenge of the, the twilight of the winter and of this time in the earth game that I think we're all courageously awakening into and choosing, I should hope, to play. Well, I've really enjoyed our chat here today, and I know we could speak for weeks, and I have probably that many more questions, but um, can you share a little bit about how people can find you where you're sharing some of your stories? Yeah, sure. My website is morethanastrology.com, and um, you can also find my YouTube channel which you'd find under more than astrology or Gemini Brett. Um, there's a lot of videos there. And as I said earlier, um, mostly it's been focused recently on this Venus cycle and these changes that are reflected in her cycle to the awakening of the global goddess and how the masculine can support that. And that project's called the 13th flower where I'm doing interviews with all sorts of astrologers and healers and feelers from many walks of the way. That's a 19 month thing that began August, 2015 will run until March of 2017. If I can keep it up. I also have a podcast that's called the starry telling podcast. So S T A R R Y T E L L I N G and all that stuff you can find at my website, more than astrology.com and, if you come by, please introduce yourself. So there's also a public Facebook group for this Venus thing um, that's called the Sovereign Scepter of the Lioness. So if you can spell that, you can find us there and join up. Well, I'll put what I can in the comments below. Well, to, um, to show you what came through on this Friday. Ta-da! Wow. Can I see that? It, 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 it's so it's so childlike but this is the vision i have and i have to just express the vision and that's so beautiful cross is filled with hearts many hearts and the um these are actually heart-shaped leaves that i printed on there so it looks a little messy but it is it's a bit of a portal it's a bit of a flying carpet and um the birth portal yeah, I, first of all, I love that you're showing that because when you say it's like childlike, that takes a lot of courage, right? But gosh, childlike, this is, this is why I got the, the, um, the Gemini Smurfs out today because that Gemini archetype, you know, it's the wonder of youth and the truth of being young and having fun and this creative gift. You know, remember when we didn't have these judgments of ourselves, and we didn't need to create some masterpiece and we didn't have to worry about the audience that we would show our art to. And we were just artists and we were just creating for creation's sake. And my greatest prayer is that we will all return to that space 
And it just, the, the release of judgment to just honor ourselves as living artists is one of our great challenges right now. And there's so much, I look forward to looking back to this video and pausing it and staring at that image for a while. One thing I saw was how um, the colors of the spectrum and the rainbow, how there's the like indigo in the middle and on the outside. And as you call that a, a vortex or a portal, that um, light sharing really brings me into that space. So I think I'll drink some good tea and trip out on that a little bit later. Um, and also because you brought it up, I did mean to ask you earlier when you were sharing about your evolution into astrology, um, my initial question was how does that compare to what you loved as a child? Like what you're in right now, are you noticing any correlations of your reality and, and your, your, the little boy in your life? Yeah, well, that's a lovely question, and I appreciate you asking it um, because I haven't really framed that in my own experience that way, and it would be a really wonderful meditation for me. But I think, yeah, this word that's coming out of me so much recently is just wonder and just fascination you know like why is the sky blue <laughs> and astrology some people really work with it and and i and i feel in a sense it's a disservice to say oh well this equals this and i'm doing this some this is what saturn is this is what neptune is you add the two things together and it equals this and that doesn't give this art that is astrology an opportunity to be an art it becomes only this science, only this rigid thing. And it doesn't give it space to evolve and to live. And that also is a little bit alive in Saturn and Neptune. Like, what, where, what is, where is it worth us to be rigid and to, and to really know our truth? And where is it a beautiful calling and opportunity for us to just be loose? and to allow information to come in. And how can those two work together so we can really become activated in our living experience? And so, yeah, astrology does that for me and brings me back, I think, to a worldview I held before I was told it was wrong, that anything can happen. Everything is real, you know? And it also really tickles my science and my math and my engineering side because I love that stuff. Yeah. You know, but the more I open to the intuitive and to the heart space, it's funny. Now I'll do like math on somebody's chart or whatever, and I can't like subtract 156 from 340. Like I used to be the best mathematician in the room, or at least I thought so. And now it's like, whoa, that what? Like what? And, and, Instead of getting down on myself about it, it's like, wow, it's working. I'm opening up. I'm balancing the left and the right, the yin and the yang, mm -hmm. and just relaxing what I always knew to open this new space will allow them to then come together and embrace and empower one another. And that's such a wonderful challenge that I think we're all also being called into, each in our own unique and beautiful ways, and that's why we are all just individual facets of this beautiful shining gem that is all that is. Wonderful. I think you you actually answered the last question I was going to ask, and there there you have it. Well, astrology is about future telling, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so yeah. much. It's been such a joy, and I, I look forward to talking to you again. Aloha. Thank you for the opportunity and, and for sharing your wisdom and for and for doing what you do. I had, a, I had a really fun time like traveling through some of your previous interviews this week and I look forward to doing it more because you're bringing together all sorts of wonderful people with different worldviews and I'm so honored to have been included on the list and I really look forward to seeing you in the heavens of Hawaii under those beautiful bright stars another time sometime hopefully soon. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Aloha.